Hey guys, welcome back to the final lecture in the pulmonary section. Uh, in this one, we're just going to cover some of the assorted respiratory conditions that we haven't covered yet. So let's dive in. First up, let's talk about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So this is a condition where patients have a diagnosis of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or with asthma, and they develop symptoms following the administration of a COX-1 inhibiting NSAID. Now, the symptoms can include things like uh, nasal symptoms, so nasal congestion or rhinorrhea. They may develop ocular symptoms like periorbital edema, conjunctival injection, and or asthmatic symptoms like wheezing, dyspnea, cough, or bronchial obstruction. Now, the reaction to these NSAIDs is typically seen from 30 minutes up to 3 hours after ingestion, and it presents as a sudden worsening of asthma and nasal congestion. So, pulmonary symptoms of patients with this condition these are caused by eosinophils and leukotrienes. Keep in mind that this is not, however, IgE-mediated. The treatment here involves standard treatment of asthma and chronic rhinosinusitis. This means we'll use medications like leukotriene inhibitors and leukotriene receptor blockers. Now, patients should avoid the use, of course, of NSAIDs moving forward unless there's a very strong indication for their use. So uh, let's use aspirin as an example. If they have atherosclerotic uh, heart or vascular disease, and they require antiplatelet therapy. Um, that would be a scenario where uh, we would want them to undergo desensitization therapy so that they can get the therapeutic benefits. Next up is allergic rhinitis. This typically develops in childhood or even young adulthood, and patients who have eczema or asthma are more likely to develop this condition. Now, one of the unique findings of allergic rhinitis compared to other forms of rhinitis is the presence of nasal itching. Now, children may repeatedly rub their noses, push the tip of their nose up, and sort of cause a, a transverse nasal crease, like go at their nose really aggressively. Um, and they may also develop what are known, what is known as an allergic shiner. This is a bluish gray or purplish discoloration seen under the eyes. That's also a very common sign of this. Now, allergic rhinitis can be seen in response to specific exposures as well. So pets, certain seasonal pollens, or um, it can be attributed to allergens around the house, like dust mites or even cockroaches. Now, you want to watch for this in patients who already have, like I said, eczema or asthma, and then who develop allergic rhinitis. On exam, the nasal mucosa is edematous, it is pale, and it's often um, along with the presence of allergic conjunctivitis. So that's another important thing to just keep in mind. This, this is uh, strictly a clinical diagnosis. There's nothing else that needs to be done. No labs, no imaging. So... Um, once you've identified the clinical findings, you've got your diagnosis. Next up, we have non-allergic rhinitis. This tends to have an onset at a bit of a later age, and it presents with things like nasal congestion, post-nasal drainage, and it's persistent all year long. Now, there's no association between this condition and seasonal change. That's an important detail that can be used if we get confused in a vignette if we're dealing with allergic versus non-allergic. Now, this could also develop in response to things like smoke, exhaust, uh, perfumes, cleaning products, or even temperature changes. Now, this is a diagnosis of exclusion that we can make after other common causes of rhinitis have been ruled out. Next up, we've got bronchiectasis. Now, in order for a patient to, to develop bronchiectasis, two conditions have to be met. The first is that the patient must be infected with a lung pathogen, and the second is that the patient must have some difficulty in resolving the infection, whether that's due to an, ina an inadequate immune response, impaired drainage, or even airway obstruction. Now, when it comes to immune cells, the cell type that plays an important role in the development of this condition is the neutrophils, and in particular, neutrophilic proteases such as elastase. So you have the presence of this bacteria, the infection grows in size, the neutrophils come in and they try to take care of the infection. They release a ton of inflammatory and destructive proteases. This causes tissue damage and progressive airway destruction. Now, the main feature seen in bronchiectasis is cough with daily sputum production lasting from months to years. But patients may also have rhinosinusitis, dyspnea, uh, hemoptysis, or pleurisy. Physical exam findings that you need to take a look out for include wheezing, crackles, or digital clubbing. Okay, those are all things that you could possibly see. Now, some conditions can lead to the development of bronchiectasis, and you'll see that the way in which they contribute to its development is via one of the criteria that we laid out earlier. Now, as a quick reminder, that includes infection, impaired drainage, airway obstruction, or an impairment in host immune responses. Now, airway obstruction can be caused by a foreign body aspiration 
or an intraluminal or extraluminal growth that causes obstruction and compresses the airway. Obstruction can occur via obstructive lung diseases like asthma, COPD, or even alpha-1 antitrypsin. Cystic fibrosis, which of course is responsible for, for producing those very thick secretions, could also result in an obstruction, as can primary ciliary dysfunction. So genetic conditions play a role. Any number of causes of immunosuppression can also lead to bronchiectasis, such as the use of a biologic disease-modifying agent or any of the uh, genetic immunodeficiencies. Autoimmune diseases such as rheumatic disease and Chagrin syndrome can also contribute to the development of bronchiectasis, as could an infection, particularly with aspergillus. Now, the workup for bronchiectasis includes a CBC with differential, because we want to assess for leukocytosis, and a sputum culture and smear, because we want to identify the causative pathogen. Quantitative immunoglobulin testing should also be performed to make sure that the recurrent or prolonged infection that is lasting months to years is not caused by some sort of immunodeficiency. Additionally, we should test in a young person for cystic fibrosis. Now, in terms of imaging, either a multi-detector CT or high-resolution CT will be your imaging modalities of choice, with the multi-detector CT being the preferred modality. Both of these imaging modalities, however, should be able to detect bronchial wall thickening and lack of tapering. They should be able to identify airway dilation with a signet ring sign being visible. And this sign is caused by the dilated bronchus and pulmonary artery branch that are seen in a cross section. Chest x-ray findings that are commonly obtained but not diagnostic would include findings like linear atelectasis and dilated and or thickened airways. Now, Treatment for bronchiectasis involves using airway clearance techniques, uh, having them go to pulmonary rehabilitation, and treating any underlying condition if possible. Now, when your patient has an exacerbation, which will manifest as worsening clinical symptoms over a 48-hour time period, they should be treated with antibiotics that are tailored based on their prior cultures and antibiotic sensitivities. All right, next up, we have acute bronchitis. This is usually caused by infections with a respiratory virus or occasionally with bacteria, which causes acute inflammation of the bronchi. Now, the symptoms you want to look out for here include either a productive or even a non-productive cough that is normally going to self-resolve within one to three weeks. Diagnosis can be made clinically here, so no labs are needed, no imaging is needed, um, if no other diagnosis, of course, is being considered. Treatment here is with supportive care, we can give dextromethorphan and or uh, guaifenesin as needed for uh, sputum production. All right, the last condition we're going to talk about here is the pneumothorax. So a pneumothorax is, of course, caused by gas that gets into the pleural space, and it's often associated with acute dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain. Some cases, though, are asymptomatic. So you have, might have one and patient is completely fine. Now, the pneumothorax, of course, can be uh, primary occurrence. That's typically going to be seen in a young patient who is thin or who is a smoker. Uh, it could also be associated with lung diseases like COPD, cystic fibrosis, or even pulmonary malignancies. It's also possible to develop a pneumothorax as a result of traumatic introduction of air into the pleural space. So if the patient was stabbed, if they were out in the street and they got stabbed with a knife, or even I iatrogenically. So if you are performing, we talked about this earlier, a thoracentesis and you screw it up, that could also just induce a pneumothorax. Now, in cases where we are going to deal with hemodynamic instability or in cases of severe respiratory distress, a bedside ultrasound should be used immediately to identify the pneumothorax. Then we place either a catheter, we do tube thoracostomy or aspiration via a needle, whichever is faster and whichever is readily available at the bedside should be done. Stable patients can have a bedside chest x-ray, which usually, uh, which is usually what's performed in clinical uh, practice, or we could do a chest CT, which is the most accurate imaging modality. And then we have a catheter or tube thoracostomy if the pneumothorax is symptomatic and large. A small asymptomatic pneumothorax can sometimes be observed for a spontaneous resolution. So if they're small and there's no symptoms, we can do the wait and watch and see sort of uh, approach. All right, here's a chest x-ray showing a large pneumothorax in the right lung. Uh, one thing I just want to point out is that the difference between your, your typical pneumothorax and your tension pneumothorax is uh, the tension pneumothorax will typically show displacement of the trachea 
um, away from the side of the lesion, whereas a normal pneumothorax, you're not necessarily going to see that. All right, let's do a couple content review questions. Here's your first one. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is C. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Figure this one out and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. And our final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need a little more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of this lecture. That is the end of pulmonary. So I will see you in the next topic.